When the transit wheels grind to a stop in New York City, it's worldwide news. 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 New York City. F-A-Q. It's Harry Siegel here with Christina Greer and producer Alex Lynn. A Don't Bury the Lead, Alex's public exhibition of local journalism in New York City that you should come and see in New York City. It's really got to be seen to be believed at 321 Canal Street through January and possibly beyond. You can find all the details at FAQ.NYC. So I'm really excited that we're joined uh, this week by Susan Watts, who's the director of visual content for New York City Controller and, more important, FAQ NYC guest, Scott Stringer. And Susan, before that, was a photographer for the uh, New York Daily News, New York's picture newspaper for, what, 25 years. Mm -hmm. Susan, uh, thank you so much for joining us and coming in to, well, paint a picture about some of your pictures. Um, you can see a few more of them at FAQ NYC. Thank you so much. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. This space is amazing. I The moment I walked in, I felt like I was home. Oh, It felt so good. All the newspapers, and I couldn't believe that I was actually seeing the papers, the actual newspapers that were blown up and hung in the offices mm -hmm. of the Daily News. Mm -hmm. And to see all these old papers warms my soul, <laughs> warms my creative heart, and it's it's just an amazing space, and, and I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you. Well, Thank feel you. free to take some pictures. I sure will. <laughs> so I will. Speaking of heartwarming, um, I love the story of how you first got to the uh, news. But before we get to that, I'm hoping that you can tell me about this one incredible shot you took for the news, I believe in 1995, of uh, Sheikh Omar Rahman in a federal prison. And, you know, this is the guy behind the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, and he usually looks the part. And in this shot, he just has this uh, this huge, actually sort of lovely smile. Yes, yes. Okay. Greg Smith and I were sent out to the federal prison in Missouri after uh, Itzhak Rabin was assassinated to get uh, a statement from Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman. And we flew out to Missouri with uh, an interpreter who was later indicted also for terrorist activity, hmm. but he was our translator at the time. And I really wanted to make a picture that looked like prison. And we were led into this very nondescript room. It looked like a lunchroom. Hmm. And I thought, oh my God, we came all this way. I really need to make a prison-y kind of picture of this guy. And there was just nothing in this room that would lend itself to that. And I became inf increasingly frustrated. And I even approached one of the prison officials and said, can I please just go, you know, get him in his cell, you know, anything down a hallway. No, 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 this is it. And the interview went on for a very long time. And so I was making these very sort of close up portraity kind of shots. And that's really not what I wanted. And as the interview was coming to a close, I saw one of the walls on either side by the ceiling with these two mirrors and a line of chairs. And it was very graphic looking. And so as he was being escorted out, I said, wait, 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 can I please bring him back and have him sit in the center of this row of chairs with these two mirrors on either side? And I got down on my belly at that time, I was using a camera where you could take off the entire um, eyepiece, oh. the viewfinder. So I was looking above, uh, you know, uh -huh. from above, and I tilted the frame up, and I was laying on my belly making this very low-angle picture. And suddenly, the interpreter said something to him in Arabic. And he starts laughing. He bursts out laughing with this huge smile on his face. Click, click, click. Uh -huh. There was my picture. And so after I shot, I said, what did you say to him? Uh -huh. And he said in this very thick accent, there is an American woman bowing at your feet. <laughs> <laughs> and there's your photo. And there's the photo. And it's very rare that you would see one of the world's notorious terrorists in, a, in, in the midst of a belly laugh. Mm -hmm. So can we back up just a little bit? Because, you know, before we started... Um, the podcast is for our listeners out there. We were, um, because Susan's had so many careers and awards, we were trying to think of how we should list her <laughs> on the website. Um, and I said, badass, just period, right? Like sometimes you just don't need a whole bunch of words. But can you walk us through 
your career and your start? Because when we think about photojournalists, oftentimes it's a very male profession. Yeah. You've been a leader in your profession. And so for many listeners out there, um, many of whom, you know, are kind of shutterbugs and possibly thinking about getting into the industry or um, thinking about why there aren't more women in the industry, mm-hmm. walk us through sort of what that looks like. I mean, were you one of those kids that like stole your parents, you know, Nikon and ran out into the yard or or like, how did it get started? Okay. So when I graduated, after I graduated from college, I moved to LA and I thought I had wanted to get into the music business. So I got a job, which initially it was an internship at Geffen Records in LA. (laughs) And I was working at Geffen Records in the publicity department. And every night I went running home to my homemade darkroom in my bathroom. And I was printing pictures and taking pictures and I was so into photography. And I had this fantasy, this pipe dream that I wanted to be a newspaper photographer. And I had no idea how that would ever happen or manifest itself. Now, did you take photography in college or high school? I went to NYU film school. So I studied filmmaking but I was really into music. So I thought I had wanted to go into the music business. So I left NYU film school, not wanting to go into the film business and wanting to go into music. And about a year into my job there, I said, I definitely want to be a photographer. And one day I approached my boss and said, you know, I'm also a photographer. And she said, well, why don't you start shooting some stuff for us? So she would send me to shoot some record release parties and some concerts. And I was doing little things here and there. And um, this is actually an interesting story. Before I tell you how I got into the Daily News, I'll tell you the first publication that ever paid me to to take pictures. So the biggest band in the world at that time was Guns N' Roses. Oh, I had earrings, one gun, one rose. (laughs) I love it. Well, Life Magazine wanted to put Axl Rose on the cover of the magazine. So they were lobbying really hard to get Axl Rose. And he hated interviews. He was, it was, he was a very challenging personality to, to get anything done. And it was taking months and months and months to get him to commit and actually do it. So they sent out one of their editors, a guy named Josh Simon, who I later became very good friends with. But I said, oh my God, you know, here's Life Magazine. Wow. Let let them know I'm also a photographer. So I quickly thrown together some kind of portfolio of stuff that I had taken. And um, I knew he wanted Axl Rose and I wanted Life Magazine. So we were schmoozing each other a little bit. And I showed him my work and he's like, oh, you know, it's pretty good. And so all of a sudden, the LA riots break out. Oh, the infamous LA riots, right? He was out there and was assigned to shoot the LA riots. And he calls me up and he says, you're coming with me. I need a photographer in L.A. And so the next thing I know was the aftermath of the riots. We're going around L.A. shooting all the aftermath, all the aftermath of the L.A. riots. And even though, unfortunately, at that time, none of my pictures ran, I got a check in the mail from Life magazine. And the very first publication to ever pay me any money was Life magazine. Wow. <laughs> that was my first day rate. Anyway, so I decided I ultimately wanted to work for newspapers. And I moved back to New York, which is where I'm from. And again, I didn't know anybody in the business. And I decided to take a class at ICP, which is the International Center of Photography, a class that was taught by Angel Franco, who was a very talented photojournalist at the New York Times. And I remember sitting in the class and and Angel Franco said, the next time you're sitting at home watching TV, wait a minute, why are you sitting at home watching TV? <laughs> why aren't you out taking pictures? So the next time I was sitting at home watching TV, his voice came into my head. And I said, why am I sitting here watching TV? Angel Franco said I should be out there taking pictures. So I grab my gear and I start wandering the streets of New York and I come upon a fire at a nursing home and all these gurneys with, you know, elderly people are being brought out and ambulances and it was all very exciting. And so this TV cameraman said to me, hey, you know, I've never met you before. Where, you know, who do you work for? I said, well, I just moved from LA. I'm trying to break into the business. He goes, well, why don't you ride with me and I'll teach you the ropes. 
and he taught me how to listen to a police scanner and he used to quiz me on all the codes. Um, what's a 1075, what's a 1013? And you know, he would sort of test me. And a couple weeks later, amazingly, a huge story happened. There was a ship filled with hundreds of illegal Chinese immigrants called the Golden Venture. And the ship got grounded off the coast of the Rockaways. And hundreds of people started jumping in the water. And there was this enormous rescue effort by the Coast Guard and the fire department and the police department. And we heard it on the police scanner. And so we ran out to Queens and I made all these pictures on the beach of, of this huge rescue effort. I went back to my dark room that I rented down on 12th Street, developed all the film myself, made contact sheets. And Sunday morning, I called the Daily News, cold called the Daily News. And Mike Lipak, who was the photo editor at the time, uh, answered the phone. And I said, hey, I have pictures of this you know, boat thing. Can mm -hmm. I bring this in? So I bring in the pictures and he says to me, and he's this very sort of cinematic character, you know, very gruff, like hard boiled New York, you know, uh -huh. New York picture editor who started many a career for a lot of photojournalists, legendary photo editor in this town. And he's like, who are you, kid? I never seen you before. <laughs> Is he chewing a cigar? Yeah, he's like, he's got a <laughs> cigarette dangling out of his mouth. And, you know, I never seen you before. Where do you, where'd you come from? I said, well, I just moved here from LA. And he said, well, what? What we doing out on the beach at, you know, three o'clock in the morning out in the Rockaways? I said, well, I heard it on the police scanner. And he goes, well, what, would you go to some 24-hour lab? How, how'd you get this stuff developed? I said, well, I did it myself in my dark room. He grabs the contact sheets and he's looking through and he's circling and he's making all these marks. And I'm like, oh, my God, yeah. he's looking at my stuff. And he looked at me, he goes, kid, you're impressing the shit out of me, kid. Do you want to <laughs> go do an assignment for us? I said, yes, I do gives me an assignment. The next day, I go run to the newsstand. First thing in the morning, I have pictures in the paper. Huge pictures in the paper. I couldn't even carry them back to my house. I had a stack of papers like this. So I go do the assignment. I bring the assignment back to him. He looks at the assignment. He looks at the pictures from the assignment and he says, okay, kid, I won't make you rich, but I'll pay your rent. You got yourself a job. Now, why the Daily News? Something inside of me told me to go to the Daily News. It was New York's picture paper. Uh -huh. It's history of pictures and photojournalists. I mean, I knew the names of the photo. They were like rock stars to me. They were like the Beatles, you know? <laughs> they were the Axl when Roses of Right. And, you know, <laughs> when I went in there and suddenly I was working alongside Danny Farrell and, you know, Jimmy Hughes and, and all these guys, you know, Danny Farrell who, you know, photographed... JFK's funeral, the picture of John John saluting the coffin. He would tell stories of being in Marilyn Monroe's dressing room and photographing the Beatles at Shea Stadium. And he's giving me tips and he's mm -hmm. being so generous, you know, with mentoring. And I, I just couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Right. And now, were there any other women? Yeah, yeah, uh, there were. Were, there were. Uh, uh, Nicole Benjavino was on staff at the time. Linda Catafo, star sports shooter. Um, there were a lot of female freelance photographers there as well at the time. Yeah. And I looked up to a lot of the women at the Times. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of female photojournalists at the Times. Suzanne DiCillo, Andrea Moen, Sarah Krolwich. Uh, the list goes on and on. Mm -hmm. And these are the people that I, I looked up to, that, that I wanted to be like. And there were a lot of female photojournalists back then. I mean, certainly it was a male-dominated profession. Mm -hmm. But I can absolutely say that I never felt that my gender prohibited me from doing any assignment. In fact, just the opposite. I mean, you know, Mike Lipak would treat us all equally. He cared about talent and mm -hmm. what you brought back to the paper. Mm -hmm. He never judged you by your gender. He threw me everywhere. I shot everything. Mm -hmm. I shot sports. I shot politics. I shot feature stories. I shot medicine. Or, you know, it ran the gamut. I shot it all and my gender never mattered. But he used to always send a woman when covering the mob because he believed that no mobster would ever beat up a woman. So he would always send women to cover oh. the mob. <laughs> yeah, that was his belief that a mobster's not gonna beat up a woman. And was that validated? No, no photographers were beaten up in the course of a Daily News uh, mob shots? 
Well, I, I mean, Especially I wasn't. I, I remember a story I was on with Greg, an another story with Greg Smith, and, and it was a, a day in the life of, of John Gotti Jr. Mm. And I mm -hmm. remember saying to Greg, does he know we're doing this story? Does John Gotti Jr. know we're doing a day in the life of him? And he's like, no. So we're camped out in front of his house in Long Island. And I'm like, what are we doing here? <laughs> right. This is ludicrous. So he comes out to get his morning paper and his robe. And he's no dummy. He looks up and he spots us like this. Mm -hmm. And I go, oh, we're made. That's it. The bad kind of made. The bad <laughs> kind of made. There's made and there's made. Right. <laughs> so he gets dressed and he comes walking towards the car. And I have this 300 millimeter lens and I'm shooting him like a machine gun as he's coming closer, closer, closer to the car. And he's getting bigger and bigger and bigger <laughs> and bigger in the frame. And I'm like, I can't put the camera down because if I put the camera down, he's gonna talk to me and I can't, he can't, oh, the, oh, this whole scene is wrong. So I put the camera down like a character out of Goodfellas. What are you doing here front of my house? <laughs> My children are here. What are you doing here? Go to my office. What are, you, what are you doing here in front of my house? I go, I'm just doing my job, Mr. Gotti. I'm sorry. I'm just doing my job. Get out of here. I don't want you here in front of my house. So he goes back inside. I go, okay, Greg, you ready to leave? And he goes, no, we got to follow him. I go, oh, God, we got to follow him. So he gets in his car and he drives us and we're trying to follow him. He's running red lights, he's making right turns, left turns, and he completely loses us. So once again, I turn to Greg, I go, oh, Greg, okay, we're done. He <laughs> goes, go oh, no. The office. <laughs> he goes, let's go to the, the hunt and fish, the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club. We'll wait for him. So <sighs> this is just, we're going down, man. We're just going down and going down. So we go to the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club, and there we are. And there comes Mr. Gotti into the Bergen Hunt, and I'm, I got him again, going in. Then he sends out his friends to come and talk to us. How many friends? Two friends. Well, that's all you that need. They start circling my car <laughs> like sharks. And they come up to, to, and they said, may we help you? Once again, just, do, just, just doing our jobs here. He said, well, Mr. Gotti would like to ask you to please go home. And I turned to Greg and I said, we are done right. for the day. Right. That's a wrap. That's a wrap. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So Lipak believed that, you know, I mean, I didn't get beat up, thankfully, but, okay. you know. Now, did you ever pitch stories or were you primarily assigned to go to stories? It varies. Okay. It completely varied. Sometimes I would pitch stories. Sometimes I would get assignments. It, it ran the gamut. Yeah. What's a story that you pitched that you're particularly proud of? So, uh... I couldn't say that this is a story that I pitched, but it's a story that I that 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 evolved out of a, out of an assignment, and I was tasked with going to the Bronx to photograph a van that gave out clean needles and condoms to prostitutes. So the reporter uh, Linda Iglesias, very talented reporter, and I went to the Bronx. And I was making all these very sort of anonymous pictures of, you know, a prostitute being handed a bag of condoms. And I thought, there's got to be more up here. There's a lot of stories up here that need to be told. And um, I saw this woman come walking down the street, and she just looked like death, walking death. And I thought, God, you know, how does she survive out here on the streets? And I introduced myself to her. And I told her I was a photographer with the Daily News and I'd like to come and hang out with her. This is 1997. Mm -hmm. And this was up in Hunts Point. Mm -hmm. And Hunts Point was very different mm -hmm. back in the day. Very different. Mm -hmm. Very, very different place than it is today. And uh, she agreed. She said, yeah, you can come hang out with me. And proceeded to get her condoms and her needles and took us to a shooting gallery where she wrapped her purse around her arm and cooked her heroin and shot up. And we saw her whole life up there in the Bronx. And Pete Hamill was the editor of the Daily News at the time. And he uh, was a visionary and had a very different idea of, of the paper. And 
I brought my first day's shoot to him and I said, this is what I did today. And he said, you go back and go back and go back and you let me know when you're done. When the story's done, you come to me. Mm. So we spent a tremendous amount of time up there with her um, as she worked the streets and dealt with drug dealers and being drug sick. And, you know, it, it was a heartbreaking story to work on. So, so when you're going up there, and this is before cell phones and all that. Oh, yeah, we had no cell phones. Showing up at her door? How are you finding no, her? No, so, so funny enough, um, we be, sort of befriended all the, all the people. Folks in the community. Uh, all it's the folks community. in the community. So they used to call, her name was Gloria. So we'd say, hey, you know, have you seen little Gloria? Where's little Gloria? Oh, yeah, we saw her around here on that street. Or, yeah, we saw Gloria, you know, just down over there. And so it would take us a while every day to find her. And, uh, you know, we eventually would find her each day. Sometimes we would find her right away. Sometimes it would take hours. Sometimes we couldn't find her. You mm -hmm. know, she was living on the streets. She, there was a handmade wooden shack that someone had built and she would pay the guy like five bucks to crash there for the night. You know, it was like a filthy old couch that she would sleep on and, but she had nowhere to live. And, uh, and then when we felt we were ready, uh, the story ran and on a Sunday paper on the front page of the New York Daily News, when families were sitting around eating their cornflakes, there was Gloria, a heroin addict, prostitute, crack addict, you know, smoking a crack pipe. And you opened up the paper to a special section of eight pages, eight full pages in the Daily News. And I think 27 pictures of her. Mm. Really raw, raw photographs of her life up there. And it really resonated with folks. The reaction that mm -hmm. the public had was pretty overwhelming. The Daily News was flooded with letters and phone calls of people offering help and different drug treatment programs wanting to send search teams up to the Bronx to try to find her. And, you know, letters from fathers who sat their daughters down to show them the story as a cautionary tale of what can happen. And it became part of the lesson plan for incarcerated women at Rikers Island. And, you know, it, mm -hmm. it, really, it really resonated with people. And, um, of course, we needed to make sure that Gloria was okay. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were terrified for her because now there was a bounty out on her head because she had exposed the neighborhood the drug dealers were pissed, the prostitutes, everyone was pissed at her. And so they wanted her dead. And then we had to find her, you know, and then she was missing in action. We would go up every day and we, you know, we couldn't find her. And eventually she was found, you know, with the newspaper folded under her arm, terrified. And I think, you know, for the first time in her life, you know, it became a mirror for her. She saw herself mm -hmm. truly for the first time. And she finally accepted help. You know, there were several times during the shooting of the story where she was really drug sick and it was really, really difficult to witness. And I would say to her, come on, come on, let me take you to the hospital. And she refused and she wouldn't go. But this, this forced her, yeah. this forced her to go. She couldn't go on anymore. So she went into detox. And she, we got her into Phoenix House. And she, she went into Phoenix House. She got herself clean. She reunited with her family. She had a 13-year-old daughter. Her daughter had been taken away from her when she was a year old. Mm -hmm. And she reunited with her family. She reunited with her daughter. And she got clean. And the Daily News did a follow-up story on her recovery. Mm -hmm. Another eight-page special section pull out uh, with another 28 pictures in it. And it was pretty incredible to witness and document this transformation of a life. I mean, I was transformed by it. And it, it, it was a, an absolute, uh, uh, it changed my life to, to see this. And, and, you know, Gloria lived 18 years. She lived 18 more years. Because, because of the story we did. And, and that's, 
that's pretty extraordinary. What made her, do you think, agree to do this in the first place? And how was it in the course of while you're shooting this and before she's looked into this mirror, you know, day to day going up there and, and shooting, shooting with her? She had tried and failed drug treatment programs in the past. And she always wound up back on the streets. And I think deep down, somehow she saw it as a way out. That's why she probably agreed to let us in, knowing that this is this is going to be it. You know, I, I won't be able to have this kind of exposure and not get clean after this. I mm -hmm. think I think she was desperate for help, but just didn't know how to how to get the help. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, I mean, as we were talking about earlier, I I'm so curious as to what this story would look like in 2020. Yeah. Because so many more families are dealing with a loved one in the Bronx and Staten Island primarily right. um, who are struggling with opioid and heroin addictions. That's right. Um, and how it would resonate with with your viewers now yeah. um, because so many more people have a direct connection, That's not right. just as a cautionary tale or right. someone who con who's concerned, but, I mean, some people would be looking at a Gloria yeah. and seeing their own sisters That's and right. classmates and, and friends right. and neighbors yeah. in, a, in a different way. Because, That's I mean, right. in, in so many ways, this story was ahead of its time. I mean, yes, it was definitely something that the Bronx was struggling with, but when we fast forward roughly 30 years, I mean, this is, it resonates so much. I mean, I feel like we could rerun this story and... it's It feels contemporary. It could, yes, it's, it's a timeless story, sadly. Sadly, it is. Hmm. It is. And I think that's why it, you know, it, it put a face and a human being, um, you know, she wasn't dismissed as some statistic. Mm -hmm. You couldn't help mm -hmm. but look at it. You couldn't help it. Right. It was every it was in your... Is it's, it's humans right. that make it's up humans. said It's epidemic. people who are, mm -hmm. who are suffering from, from this. So. so speaking of humans, you know, you, you're finding just individuals with powerful stories and helping to capture them and, and get those attention. And then you're also getting pulled out to, to cover people who are already iconic. Um, and, and to figure out how to how to show something new and fresh in their stories. And you told me a couple great ones. And there's this incredible photo of uh, of the Pope when he's visiting New York and at the 9-11 uh, Museum, where somehow you end up with just him alone in a photo. Uh, you found Hillary Clinton at a different point. I, I know we could each one of these could be its own episode, but I'd love to hear just a bit about, uh, about that sort of photography and um, a couple of those stories, if you can. So um, that was sort of a daily, a, a daily story. I mean, it was a very big story. The Pope, Pope Francis, was coming to New York for the very first time, and he was making all these stops, and he was going to the 9-11 Museum. And uh, typically, um, they'll pool the, the, that event. And when they pool it, it means they select a particular photographer to be the pool photographer, and then that photographer's images get distributed to all the different outlets. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of pressure on you, right? You got to make good stuff because mm -hmm. you're the only game in town. Like your your pictures are the ones that are going to be distributed. So, and, and how does one get selected on those? Particular the New York events? Press Photographers Association had done the selection process for this particular okay. event. So they chose who would go where, and they worked with the police department and all the different agencies okay. to um, coordinate who would be the best person for each location and each event. And so I was chosen to be at its, they call it the blue wall. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the wall where. Um, the remains of the victims are, there's a repository mm -hmm. behind this wall. So I went the day before and I spent a, a lot of time in that space to try to mentally prepare mm -hmm. for what it's going to be like when the Pope is there. And it's such a solemn place. You know, the, the remains of the victims mm -hmm. of the World Trade mm -hmm. Center are, are, are there. And um, I knew he would be surrounded with tons of people. And I, I, I wanted to make a very poignant picture at this particular spot. 
And I had no idea how that was going to happen with, with him surrounded by people. So Michael Bloomberg uh, is on the board, and he and um, Cardinal Dolan were uh, escorting the Pope through the 9-11 Museum. And it, it was being translated to, to the Pope um, through, you know, Michael Bloomberg was telling him what was behind the wall. And in this completely organic moment, the Pope turns and walks away from the pack and says a prayer. And that was my moment. That mm -hmm. was my moment. That was the opportunity. And it happened. And it feels like he's alone. Mm -hmm. And it happened for a millisecond. It was so quick. He just, as soon as he heard what was behind that wall, he just quickly turned and said a prayer. And that, that was it. Mm -hmm. That was it. And I got, I, I, I got that moment. That 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 moment that was symbolic of of his of his visit. Susan, I have just one more question. Sure. Um, I really want to make sure we uh, we get to yeah. um, about the last couple of years and uh, working for Scott Stringer, taking images from from that perspective. Like what what what, what you learned in the course of doing that, how that works, and like what perspective it gives you on your career in uh in photojournalism prior to that you know shooting for a uh, for a for a public servant as opposed to of a public servant right it was a very interesting transition um uh when the daily news eliminated their photo department i i was at a at a real turning point in my career i'd only had one job really for 25 years you know, the, the New York Daily News has been in existence for a hundred years and I was there for a quarter of it. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure what to do. Some different opportunities were presenting themselves. And the New, the New York City Comptroller's Office was one of those opportunities. It was funny because I went into the interview. I said, well, this is my very first job interview. I've never <laughs> been on a job interview before. And they sort of fell off their chairs. I said, well, yeah, let me tell you why. I had one job my whole life. And here's how I got to the Daily News. And I told them the whole story about the boat. And, and so it was, I said, so, so this is it. This is my first job interview. And it just worked out that, you know, the chemistry was right. All the stars aligned. And I started working for the Comptroller's Office. And Scott Stringer, like, chewing a cigar. He's like, kid, it'll be a second Scott job. Scott Stringer was <laughs> chewing no cigar and was not calling me kid. It was completely <laughs> different. <laughs> completely different. Um, but I believe that, um, that type of photography is really, really, really crucial. I feel that way because very often the only way the public knows their elected officials are through pictures. Mm -hmm. And that's why I feel Obama was so successful in connecting with the public because of Pete Souza, mm -hmm. because of his photographer, who was able to photograph these very real, authentic moments that translated to the public, where you see Obama and you say, I know him, I tie my shoe too, mm -hmm. I do that too. Mm -hmm. And you felt this connection and it humanized him. And so you felt like you knew him even though you never met him. Right. And I think it really set the standard. And I, I know that everybody who works in government photography emulates that, kind, you know, wa wants to, to make those kind of pictures. And I feel very strongly about that as well. And so I approach um, the controller with that same kind of authenticity. And I, I say to him, you know, when I first started, I said, well, what do you want me to do? I said, the best thing you could do is ignore me completely. I am not even here. Please just go about your business. Mm -hmm. And so it's the moments between the moments mm -hmm. that reveal the character and the gestures. And it shows who he is as a person, who he is as a politician, who he is as an elected official, who, you know, it shows his humor, his, his heart, his kindness, you know, it's all these different moments build a picture of the man that you don't really know, that the public doesn't know, but I know him. So it's my job to translate that through the mm -hmm. photographs. And I feel really uh, uh, honored when I've been told by various photographers that I really, really respect after I started working for the controller's office that they said, you know, 
we've been looking at your work and we feel like I, and I've heard the same thing. So when I say we, I'm echoing that there are several people who have said this. We feel we know a different Scott Stringer because of the work that you've put out. Mm -hmm. Like we see different parts of him. And so I felt job well this done. Is this job. is it. This, this is, is my job. I, right. This is my job and I'm doing my job. It's tapped into different parts of my creative brain working there because I also do a lot of video. So what's been very uh, challenging for me and also like reinvigorating for me creatively is to take all of the policy initiatives, audits, and translate that into these kind of visually digestible nuggets that we can put on social media to really show the work of the office because who's going to read an audit, Right. you know? Most people so, don't know what a comptroller is. I didn't know what the comptroller <laughs> did when I, what, what the comptroller's office did when I first started. But what I found is an office full of extraordinarily dedicated, hardworking mm -hmm. public servants that want to make life better for all New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. And it has really um, reinvigorated my, my belief in government. Like it's, it's, it's it made me believe more in government when, when I see all the people I work with, all these incredibly hardworking, dedicated people. And you get to show some of them. Which is and I show nice. them right. right, and that's my and that's my job. Susan, yeah. thank thank you so much for taking the uh, oh. the time and for some of these stories. Do you have any just last words or first words of advice um, as we close out here for uh, for for people looking at uh, looking at uh, at, at photography uh, today and young women in particular, like what they uh, what maybe you wish you'd known at the the start and picked up over time. It's such a it's such a loaded question because of the state of the industry. Mm. And as encouraging as I want to be, I recommend this profession with a bit of a with a bit of a warning mm -hmm. that it will not be easy to make a living in today's journalistic climate. You know, the there you can't be sure about your rent, like you were told yes, at the start. You know, mm -hmm. there was a time that you could get a job working at a newspaper and spend your entire career there and support your family and and have have a have a 30 year career, 40 year career, 50 year career at a newspaper. And I don't know if that's true anymore. Mm -hmm. So I encourage people to continue to document, continue to you know, engage photographically and make important pictures that matter and, and do the work. But I say it with a realistic slant. It's, it's harder today than it ever was. Mm -hmm. Well, Susan, thank you to our resident badass <laughs> who makes pictures. Um, and for our listeners out there, we'll have some of Susan's photographs on our website, faq.nyc, so you can see and feel, honestly, some of Susan's work that you've done over the years. So we so appreciate not just you coming on the podcast, but what you've done to essentially document, document life in New York City for all of us to, to experience, uh, whether we were here during the time in the city or not. Thank you so much for having me. It really was a pleasure Thanks. to be here. Thank you. Promise you'll come back? I definitely will come okay. back 100%. Wonderful. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. New, new, new. New York City. F-A-Q. F -A -Q. <laughs>